I am so excited to introduce you to my guest today and he is the CEO and founder of Ripple Match. He's going to tell you a little bit about it and his name is Andrew Myers so I'd like to welcome. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I, I love the mission behind everything you're doing. Yeah I was just saying that um, before we started recording and the podcast came on that we were like chatting away about like uh, diversity and inclusion and there's so much for us to talk about so I'm actually really pumped to hear um, your views on it because I have been stalking you on uh, social media and LinkedIn not in a weird way but on like you know everything <laughs> that you guys are up to. Do you want to tell everybody who's listening a little bit about Ripple Match and what you do? Yeah, so excited to have this conversation. Um, and yeah, in terms of Ripple Match, you know, our whole mission is making it possible for college students to get amazing jobs, you know, no matter where they go to school, what their socioeconomic backgrounds are, what their racial and gender backgrounds are. And so a lot of what we do is use technology to even the playing field. The way Ripple Match works is no matter uh, where you go to school, whether it's a university, whether it's a community college, you can fill out a profile of everything that you're looking for in a job um, and a lot on your sort of values, motivations, preferences. And then we're actually able to match you with great jobs all over the country. Um, and so the sort of difference between, I think, Ripple Match and like a traditional job board is that companies really trust the algorithm to sort of unearth talent in places that they maybe haven't traditionally gone. They may be you know, doing 70% of their recruiting at, you know, a really narrow subset of schools, but then they'll use Ripple Match to sort of broaden out and make sure that they're not missing phenomenal talent that's distributed all over the country. Oh, it's so good. I was actually watching uh, one of your clients today. I don't know if I'm allowed to mention them, but they have a YouTube video of, I think it's Lenovo. Oh yeah, we, we, we love working with Lenovo. And uh, yeah. yeah, it's been an amazing, amazing partnership on yeah. that side of things. But they were singing your praises and I was watching it. And one of the things that I wanted um, people to realize, so a lot of things that happen with these enterprise companies in the States, and I know that you have like a cross section of a ripple matches, a cross section of companies that they work with. But a lot of these big companies or the Fortune 500s or whatever it would be, they generally have a very narrow view of the colleges or universities or graduates. That they, so then it means that they don't get a diverse range of talent out there so it's free ripple match is free for the candidate that's right isn't it yeah it's, it's free and always will be on the on the candidate side of things and, and, and yeah to the point that you're making there i mean i uh it really has to do a ton with sort of creating ripple match i i went to yale for undergrad but i transferred in and so i vividly remember you know what it was like to <laughs> uh, grow up in colorado where most of my friends were at you know the university of colorado and, and yeah. Colorado state and both my parents were teachers, so I came from a pretty different socioeconomic background than a lot of my friends at Yale. And I remember just getting there and thinking, you know, all these jobs that Yale students get access to that my friends aren't, it's, it's crazy because, you know, talent's distributed all over the country. And I think it's a really bizarre way to sort of determine someone's future based off of where they get into school at age 18, you know, and who their high school guidance counselor is or how they did on a standardized test. And so with Ripple Match, the whole idea was to kind of use technology to even the playing field and make it possible for great candidates all over the country to get connected with really amazing opportunities. I love that. And what I what I find um, really interesting is, you know, how much how much really it depends on accessibility. Um, I mean, I remember when I was younger, a lot younger, um, my guidance counselor told me that I should be a hairdresser because like I was from a working class family and, uh, and not that there's anything wrong with being a hairdresser if you have a passion for it, but it was just, no, because I wanted to go and like experience all these different things. And she just couldn't see me outside of my postcode. So I think what's great is that you're giving people across the country, like, and I'm, I'm like, I don't know if your plans are international yet, but like you're giving them the accessibility to just even know that those kind of roles are out there. Yeah, I think that's a really powerful example that you just shared. And I think it's true for so many college students, right? They might be brilliant in a number of areas, but so often what we know is the lives that our parents experienced. And mm -hmm. so Part of what's kind of magical about Ripple Match is because it brings opportunities to candidates 
they can sort of trust the system to get to know them and figure out where they might be good. And sometimes those opportunities that are brought to them are things that they would have never considered, but are actually a really good fit for who they are. And so that's one of the aspects of what we do that I'm most passionate about. And I think why we've sort of invested so much in the candidate experience over the years as well. Well, you've lived it. So I think that once you've lived it, and I mean, you know what it was to land in Yale, and sometimes it can be like another planet, you know, um, I remember even, I mean, again, I'm a recruiter fundamentally, like that's literally, you know, what my craft is. And I remember when I started, it was a temp job, and I moved home from Dubai, and it was really bizarre, because I thought that I had to pay the agency, like I had no idea how how it was supposed to work, you know, I was like, do I have to give them 20% of my salary or, you know, um, but other people who are from different kind of socioeconomic backgrounds were so familiar with it and, you know, so au fait with the whole system that they were miles ahead of me, but, you know, we got there. I wanted to ask you one thing before I forget, you mentioned, do you have, um, do you have like specific processes when you're hiring internally for Ripple Match? So I know what you do like as a product and um, things like that, but when you're building your Ripple Match team, um, what does that look like? Because I, I think I heard from Janelle potentially that like, you know, uh, how you try to attack talent in diverse, uh, from diverse backgrounds. Yeah, um, we work incredibly hard at that internally. And um, I think you have to be really smart and really systematic about it because unfortunately there is so much systematic bias um, built into the system. And I think you have to be really thoughtful about kind of overcoming that. And so, you know, even if you're well-intentioned, if you're just relying on job board applications and tech, for most roles, you know, 80% of those applications are white men applying for jobs often from backgrounds where technology was sort of more accessible and more mainstream. And so if you want to actually build a team that represents the population as a whole, you've got to invest a lot at the outset of the process. Because once candidates are in process, you've got to treat them completely equally, but you've got to make sure that exposure is really broad at the outset. So for our early career hiring, we use Ripple Match to do that. So we do have a little <laughs> advantage, but um, it's been amazing in terms of kind of helping us just build out um, a you know, much more representative kind of early career team. And then when it gets to the more senior positions, we actually invest a ton in agency relationships and really focus on building pipelines that are either um, underrepresented minority heavy or female heavy and really incentivize agencies to go out and kind of reach the candidates that are naturally coming into our funnel. It doesn't mean we're perfect. There's always work to do. Of course. We have to be really attentive to it, but we do just invest really heavily in trying to get the kind of most representative pool we can at the top of the funnel. And then inclusion obviously matters a ton too. And we just kind of bend over backwards to kind of create the most inclusive, welcoming culture that we can. And obviously, yeah. virtually has, has mentioned <laughs> a little bit, and COVID's thrown us a few challenges this year. But um, overall, it's something we just care a lot about as a company, and that really, really matters. Yeah. And do you know what, as well, though, like I, and I work with a lot of different companies, like internationally, and a lot of them have diversity on their website, but like it's fine attracting somebody, you know, but then it's like, how do you retain them? You know, how do you make them feel that they have like a seat at, the table you know and I think that that was a really important thing that you said it's the inclusion and the equity part of it especially on the sourcing for recruiters because I think it was I don't want to shame him it was the CEO of a bank potentially uh he said that he couldn't find good talent from the African-American community I think it was the Wells Fargo CEO but um which shocked me because sometimes you have to like I had a look at their job specs and things like that and even sometimes the way they're worded um won't attract diverse candidates like there's a whole like approach that you need to make sure that you're you're bringing these people in. and I think it's great that you guys um are really helping companies do that within Ripple Match but I do have another question for you um I have loads of questions for you but I do have another question for you Ripple Match kind of falls under HR tech or rec tech would that be but it's the it's one of the first I won't say the first but that it's really focused on the candidate so you know the way normally HR tech it's like about the company the enterprise how we yeah a little, a little stodgy and kind of just yeah you like spun it software. yeah 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 you've spun it on its head so I mean a lot of people would have thought potentially that you couldn't make money or be successful when it's focused on the candidate who's not paying and um, tell me what your thought process was with that like because it is very very like it, it, like job hunter or candidate centric 
Yeah, you know what's funny? I, I think honestly, it stems from the fact that we just sort of we originally sought out to solve a problem for our friends in college, and so I don't think we were thinking <laughs> about it through like a traditional MBA lens. It wasn't like how can we make as much money as possible as easily as possible. It was sort of yeah. like how can we create a new system, right, and to do this in a much more data driven, diversity focused, um, just inclusive way. And I think that um, this sort of like realization was you kind of need both. So companies need an operating mm -hmm. system that allows them to sort of intuitively understand their data. If they don't realize that they're struggling with representation in a given group in real time, it's very hard for them to proactively remedy it. If they're not able to successfully host virtual events, it's hard for them to reach broader groups of candidates. And so we realized there was some maybe like less sexy software that needed to be built <laughs> companies do the job well. But on top of that, we really needed to build a terrific marketplace for candidates. And I think it made the first couple of years challenging because we were just like taking on so much at once. And even now it's an incredibly complex kind of sophisticated product. But I think it's been worth it because if you can kind of pull all this stuff together in tandem, I really do believe that most companies want to do better in these areas. They just need software that actually makes it possible for them. And so by sort of combining these different elements, which I agree with you is maybe a little bit less like traditional, <laughs> like classic. I like it though, it works. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of been our, our, our sort of magic, I guess, uh, in, in terms of bringing this all together. Um, and so when you started, like, you know, so you said the origin of the idea was like helping your mates out, you know, like in China, like that was it. It wasn't like, okay, we're going to build this machine and then exit after five years. But so it was like this really, like, how do we get our friends or this or that, like access to these great opportunities? When did you realize that something had changed, that something had clicked and this is going to be maybe bigger than you imagined? Yeah, I don't think I really even knew like what a venture capitalist did fully when we started the company, right? I, I was a history major, Eric was computer science. We weren't like <laughs> majors, like plotting out the future. But I, I think that, um, I think there were a few moments along the way that were really significant. I, I think there is a beauty in building products and just getting to listen to customers. And there is a certain honesty that comes from getting a company to buy your software for the first time. And so I think like, I think it probably took us you know, 18 months of product development and building up a candidate side before you even had a single customer. And then it starts to like spiral. Yeah. Um, Do you remember your first customer? Yeah, I, uh, I, I vividly remember her name. Her, her name was Jody Fournier. She uh, was a, a leader at Corn Ferry actually, which wow. is the recruitment space you've probably heard of. And yeah, yeah. She, uh, I think she fully got the vision and kind of what it could be. I, I have to say that early product probably left a little something to be desired. <laughs> a lot of engineers got into it since, but she took a chance on us and gave us you know, a way yeah. of amazing feedback. And I'm super grateful to people like that because I think so often there's these leaders in these enterprise companies who are a little more innovative. And especially when it comes to diversity and inclusion, which is a relatively, unfortunately, you know, a somewhat new space mm -hmm. in terms of getting serious investment on the corporate level, um, I think you need people who are willing to kind of take chances and try out new stuff. And I think that's what allows these new technologies to sort of land and then make a difference. But without some people sort of taking a chance and trying it out, it would have been really difficult to kind of, you know, prove that initial traction and, and actually get a, sh a shot to this all happen. Yeah, no, 100%. I think it's so funny that like you, you were, well, of course, I wouldn't think that you forget, but I think it's so funny that you remember the exact name and how like the product has developed and, and things since then. Did you imagine that you would get to, like when you were, when you got your first sale, did you think that you would be like, you know, on podcasts and chatting to people and hiring, you know, across the country? Like, did you envision that it would get to this point? Those early days were pretty humble. I think we were in like a cramped kind of we work conference room <laughs> where we you know, were jamming a big team there. A big, big team was like six people, but it felt like a big team <laughs> was so small. And uh, yeah, you know, I, I think it is amazing to sort of see the level of scale it's getting. I think human beings in general, it's hard for us to understand how things compound. And so when an idea really takes off, especially within technology, in a relatively short time, it can go from this sort of fringe small thing to a really big sort of movement and company. And I think as human beings, you do your best to keep up and sort of internalize <laughs> all the learning, but it's not natural for anyone totally, right? You've got to kind of 
adjust yeah. to it and appreciate the slightly unusual like speed of a journey and, and, and what that can be like. I think also sometimes it's like you're in the eye of the storm, so you don't really realize like the speed that you're you're going or like that, you know, you're you're just doing what you do. Um I'd be interested to know as well, like when you spoke to your family or when your partner spoke to family and said, you know, or we're dropping out and we've turned down this job of Facebook and this is our idea. Um what was their reaction? when you kind of like let them know that this was what you were going to pursue to any of the entrepreneurs out there listening i'd be interested <laughs> on getting yeah. your your input i remember like literally like rehearsing in the mirror or what i was going <laughs> to say to my mom because i mean she was a teacher and like you know, she would wake up with me before school to help me study and here i am yeah. a year from graduating from yale which i think for her was like you know on a more traditional path kind of a, a dream and suddenly i sort of wanted to chase this crazy idea and I'll never forget it. And I remember thinking she was going to be really upset. And I think that um, she was actually like, go for it, make it happen. And, so good. But I think that's an amazing, amazing moment and an amazing amount of support to have from parents. And, I, you know, I don't, I think in a way it was an incredible risk. I think at the same time, I also did benefit from, from having tons of sort of like, like being able to go back to Yale if it failed and having a family that was supportive of it is also a huge yeah. form of privilege. And I think when you sort of do think about like the venture climate in general, I think, well, it is amazing to be able to take a risk and does take some courage. I think we also need to sort of create a system where it's easier for people to do that. And there's a little bit of a softer landing if entrepreneurs <laughs> you know, aren't able to get work or whatever. Yeah. So that's something that personally It's about. not that they just like lose everything. Yeah, no, exactly that. But but I mean, like that's that's the thing. We're actually doing something in Ireland at the moment where they're trying to encourage, like you know, entrepreneurship. Even like in, um, there's a there's a group that like you know you can go to with your ideas for like you know a startup or something like that, and um, it's like not for profit, but then they chat through your idea because as you said earlier, what you did was come up with a solution for a problem, you know, and, and that's really where all these great companies seem to um seem to start in relation to everything that you've achieved with ripple match so far do you have anything coming up like any kind of new um i suppose projects or anything like that uh, on the horizon yeah so i think there's two really exciting things um so just about a month ago we just announced a 23 and a half million dollar funding round and so it's really amazing wow. to get to sort of scale up our team on the team size will basically double this year. We'll pass hundred employees, which sounds like a really just like terrific milestone. And I think it's a validation of a lot of the hard work the team's put in this year. But then on the product side, one thing I'm just incredibly passionate and excited about is we're launching a CRM. So not a customer relationship management platform, but a candidate relationship management platform. And what that's designed to do is let companies really stay in touch with and nurture candidates that have been in their process. And so if you sort of think about it as a candidate, right? Like there's so many times you go into a job search, you go and do all this work, you just sort of miss the job, right? You're kind of a silver medalist. And then the company loses touch with you and they might've actually thought after you gained additional experience or um, you know, another role opened up that you could be a great fit, but all the data just gets lost because it's such a huge mess. So we're basically building a product that makes it possible for companies to keep in touch with all of the candidates they've interacted with to get sort of real time updating information on all of those candidates and then to, you know, market and nurture those candidates. And so they can get them into events, get them into new roles, whatever it might be. And so I think it'll just be one other really kind of powerful element of the full ripple match system in addition to our sourcing product and our events product and will hopefully provide just a better candidate experience because i think too often it's just a really awful experience looking for a job and i think it'll all kind of streamline that process for everybody a little bit hopefully no, so when is that launched when are you when is the big reveal so we have just like basically watched the uh, product with a number of beta customers who tend to be early users who are really kind of invested with what we're doing, but the early feedback's been terrific. And so I think we'll likely uh, take it to for the sort of broader market at the start of Q3 and everybody will be able to kind of purchase Ripple Match CRM. Phenomenal. And um, so with that and i find it as a recruiter actually i spoke to a few candidates yesterday and they told me that they normally don't deal with recruiters because you know either the resume goes into a black hole or they never get a call back because it's either you know you're either a fit for this role or 
and then it's good luck. So I think it's really great that uh, you're creating that for um, for candidates so they can manage their journey and, and, and do all of all of those different things. I don't I'm trying to think if there's anything else like that on the market. I can't think of anything. No, I really appreciate that. And yeah, I think that sort of automation is part of what makes it so unique. I think it sounds like a nice idea of being able to apply for any job you want, but when the reality is you spend all this time filling out applications and then companies are just inundated and have thousands and thousands of applications, so they never get back, then candidates need to apply for even more jobs. So it sort of creates this destructive flywheel that's really discouraging and a really huge waste of time for everybody involved. And I think what we're just trying to do is really use data and matching and automation to kind of cut through the noise and make it possible for people to feel confident in their job search that when they get matched with an opportunity, they're actually going to get to talk to a human being. <laughs> they may Imagine, not get job, Imagine that. We'll make sure they get the interview. And, and you know, that's, that, that's really the core of what our, our sourcing product does on the yeah. candidate side. No, I love it. And I think that it, like from a recruiter's perspective and the amount of candidates that I speak to, I think that that would solve so many problems for them. Because even when I say like, oh, so who have you applied for? And they're so frazzled that they're like, I don't remember, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, did you apply directly? Was it through an agency? And they just have no tracking system or because, you know, what I mean, I know what it's like to be unemployed. Like it's the pressure of it, you know, and thinking of your rent and this and that. And then you start to apply for roles that maybe are too junior for you and you don't get called back for them. So it's like this vicious circle where your confidence is just affected negatively, you know, in the end, like it, it's tough for them. I, I vividly remember uh, applying for junior year internships. I think I probably, you know, put in 30 job applications. And, you know, here I was thinking I'd, I'd worked on my resume and I was all ready to go. And I probably heard back from maybe two or three companies. I mean, it was minuscule sort of percentage of companies that I thought were a good fit. And it was just because I, I didn't actually know what I was qualified for and what I wasn't and really some guidance that I just couldn't get through the career services office. Yeah, no, I get that. And it's well, it's like when you ask somebody like what salary are you looking for? And they're like, oh, literally, I don't care. Like, just give me a job. So no, I think that like Ripple Match, and this is so exciting. I'd love to, um, I can't wait to like have a look um, and have a play around with it and and see it. You'll have to come back on. Product. It's, it's, it's really fun to see in action. And um, yeah, I'm obviously biased, but, but we, we work pretty hard on, on making it as sort of intuitive and, and user friendly as yeah, possible. Well, it's, well, look, if I can use it, anybody can use it. I spoke to um, a couple of your team members as well, and there seems to be a common thread um, uh, that runs through your company. Um, I, was, I won't mention the person's name, but I was talking to one of your employees, and they seem really bought into ripple match so not just the product because i understand like that you're passionate about the product and um things like that but they seem bought into like there's an energy in the office uh, this person had mentioned you know and it's like everybody seems to be on the same team there's really like a growth mindset within the company and um, people are uh i suppose engaged did you how did you set out to create that or did you or was it something that you think that filters down like culture filter filters down from the top yeah, you know, I think in the early days, you know, some of it happens accidentally, right? Companies, I think, just sort of represent the early leadership in the company, and it's really easy for it to take form. But as you get bigger, you have to, I think, be really intentional about culture and how you hire and how you promote. And there needs to, I think, be a really clear system of shared values that everybody kind of buys into. And so I think on a really high level, you know, I always think about it, and I don't think it's enough to be really talented. And it's not enough to just be a really good person. You sort of need both. And I think we try to attract people who sort of have the drive and the talent to really want to make a big impact in the world, but also want that impact to be in a positive way. And I, I think we also really do try to foster people who I think are willing to just like, I think you've got to care. You've got to be willing to be blunt and honest with people about feedback. And I think you've also just got to like be committed to like consistently growing and improving. And I think, well, I'd like to say we have like some brilliant, like, you know, cultural values. <laughs> but I think a lot of it does come down to hiring. I mean, I think obviously you've got to do a lot right and you've got to be really welcoming when people get in and have high standards. But I also think you've just got to be really deliberate about who you hire. And I think so many companies, it's like you're going to spend, you know, three years working every single day with that person, but your interview process is two hours and you don't get to know them on kind of <laughs> level. And so I think it really does stem from our employee base rather than top down. And I think it's been more just, you know, being lucky enough to attract a pretty special group of people. And then they all mm. kind of inspire and motivate each other too. On a large yeah. Level. 
Well, I don't know about, I, because there's something that you said there, I don't know about it being lucky. I think it, whether you knew it or not, when there was just six of you in the room, um, you did start with a purpose, you know, like, and there was like, and this is like the whole thing that we'd, we'd mentioned. Like for me, it's like tech for good, you know, that like, it's not just about going in somewhere or um, like for me, like as a recruiter, it's not about making money. Of course, I want to be able to pay mortgage or whatever, but I'd also like, I know that a job is central to someone's life whether they get it, whether they don't, you know, it affects their family, their wider community, any of those kind of things. So I have to, I don't say every day, but because the pandemic kind of, you know, distracted us all for a minute, but I try and, you know, set that intention for the day, like when you're going to go and, and talk to people or do this or do that, or even if you're talking for me to talk to a client, like somebody set up a business or taken a risk. So you have to be respectful with their brand um, and their time. I don't always get it right. I do my best. Is there any, I um, don't know if you can answer this, but is there any kind of mistake or lesson, maybe lessons better than the word mistake that you've had like in your career um, that you took something from? Definitely. Oh my God, we, we make mistakes. <laughs> and that's what happens when you're moving fast and hopefully you learn from them quickly. And yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll dive, dive on that in one second. You said one other thing that just like sort of triggered a thought for me just around like, you know, getting a candidate a job being one of the most like sort of significant things that you can do. And I do think there is something magic about jobs. It plays such a huge role in people's identities, you know, their ability to provide for their families. There's a reason that pretty much every single election is about the economy, right? Yeah. It's that's, your sense of purpose you know. and your sense of worth. Yeah, and I think um, one of my like favorite things is we send out this email each week that shows the faces and the sort of schools and names of every student who's gotten hired through Ripple Match and the company that they're going for. And you know, you see these companies like Amazon, Ernst and Young, you know, name brand terrific opportunities. And if you sort of think back to how things were traditionally, a lot of the faces getting sent to those schools would have been typically upper class, Ivy League, <laughs> predominantly yeah. white. And we look at these hiring reports and it's like, there's amazing students from, you know, Wichita State and uh, Spelman and you know, all of these sort of different schools all over the country, you know, North it's Carolina. Goosebumps. And, um, I have goosebumps. Yeah. I think it's amazing. Yeah. And, and so we send it out to our whole team. And I, I do think that if you don't get goosebumps, like seeing something like that, this might not totally be the right place for you. <laughs> you obsession with like, okay, like no matter where you are, you should have access to great opportunities is really what like drives us. And it's just like a huge, huge element of what, kind of what I think purple yeah. magic is. And, no, it's, it's like, even like listening to that, it is, it's like, it's the humanity behind it, you know, and it's like, it's a person and, um, and even if you're giving bad news, like you can give bad news and say, okay, you didn't get it, but this is a feedback that was super positive, reapply in six months, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's just the way that you, I think the way that you deliver it, you know, it's the whole Gary V thing, you know, of kindness, you know, like it's a superpower. So I think if you try and you try and focus on that, like that's a, that's it. Yeah, just being nice goes a long way. Doesn't mean you're not going to screw up. And as a leader, you make all sorts of it. I guess this like shifts gears so a little bit to the mistakes. Like I think startups are like I think what makes startups such a powerful force for innovation is that it's an environment where, especially in the early days, like you are really incentivized to make mistakes because if you're not making a few mistakes, you're probably not learning quickly enough. Yeah. Especially when it comes to like product and product development, but it's it's, it's true in a lot of areas and. I think that um, sometimes as companies get bigger, they get political and there's an incentive to always be right or to always look good. But I think one thing I definitely try to do some as a leader, and I know a lot of our leadership team focuses on, is just being willing to like call out when you screw up. So like, I mean, this is a small example of it. Like, <laughs> earlier this week, like I ran a meeting where I realized like maybe like 10 minutes in the way I structured it was totally just not going like, <laughs> to be the fact that I was like looking for and it was like getting bogged down. And I think just being able to say like, I structured this meeting totally wrong. Let's like reset it and try it. <laughs> like, it's a little like, you have a little bit of that, oh no, I'm like admitting yeah. like a mistake or whatever. But I think if you can just embrace that as a part of how you do, you don't spend time sort of, uh, you know, pretending an apple is an orange and kind of ignoring uh, <laughs> and expecting have. everybody else to uh to do the same no and i i would say to you that like allowing or saying that you've made a mistake and i found this over the last year like i had lost i worked in a 
another company and I lost my job like you know just around February March and what I was thinking was it was hard for me then as a recruiter to go on LinkedIn and say this is what's happened and like it was the whole thing that we were saying about when you lose your job like I it was a whole like year of lessons for me because it was like about professional grief and what you actually lose when you say somebody loses a job and what you said there even in relation to the meeting about vulnerability or you know saying okay look I messed up let's start again my biggest fear was telling people this but once I made myself vulnerable and said look this happened blah 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 I'm moving on or whatever it would be the amount of people that that gave permission to to share their experiences um has been phenomenal like I have more clients reaching out I've more candidates reaching out I've had like all of this like support from people I didn't even know were aware that I was alive <laughs> you know and it's it's created like a mini family for me or a mini support network not a family but a support ne network outside of me not working in these huge companies anymore because this is a startup I, I love that. Yeah. No, I, I think like leading through vulnerability and just being vulnerable is like one of the most like important things to kind of embrace in life. And it's not intuitive, right? Because kids, we, <laughs> no. grow up and we see these, you know, superstar athletes and, you know, we see them in prime time and you see the glossed up sort of celebrity <laughs> yeah. photos. And the it's Insta filters. Yeah. And we're, we're sort of not like the image of success isn't talking about the fact that we're all kind of figuring it out as grow and that we make huge mistakes. And so I think in the early days of Ripple Match, it was a little harder for me. I think I felt this pressure as like a young yeah. founder to like, look like I knew the answer and like have my stuff together. But I, I think now I definitely realize that like you can be a great leader and you can be a very imperfect leader. And what matters a lot more is trying to do your best, but having the sort of confidence to acknowledge when something went off course or you didn't live up to the expectations of yourself or the team or whatever it might be. So I don't know. I think good intentions matter a lot. Yeah, that was literally the word that was in my head when um, you were saying that was like the word intention. I think that if your intention is good and you can sleep at night, like, but if the quicker you admit it or the quicker that you realize there's a mistake and you say it, then the quicker you fix it and then just move on. But I think that's the whole thing of um, operating within a growth mindset. Whereas like if you have a growth mindset and you're saying like, oh, okay, I made a mistake. And you're in a fixed mindset culture where they're like, okay, no, you know, it's blame, it's this, it's that. That's when I always say to people, it's time to move because you're never going to align with the company. You know, if you want to, like, maybe somebody like that should pro probably go to a startup, you know, where it's like, you make a mistake, you learn quickly, move on, you improve. It's like fixing a bug in an app. That's like the startup mentality. A hundred percent. Yeah, I think, I think that's so totally right. Um, in relation to going forward for you or for Ripple Match, what does the rest of 2021 look like for you other than the, the launch of this like amazing new CRM? Yeah, so, you know, it's really a ton of just kind of bringing together um, everything that's happened over the past few years from a product perspective. So we launched an events uh, product um, last year that's had really good traction, CRM is coming out, and then this sort of auto match is what we call it, but our automated sourcing product has been kind of our bread and butter and signature product. And I think more and more we're becoming kind of a complete operating system for the companies that we work with. So in the early days, it was amazing to be able to automate finding, you know, high quality, diverse talent from all over the country. And I think that was really powerful, but I think what we've started to realize that to like maximize our impact, we also need to be able to help um, companies manage their candidates from other sources to keep track of all those existing relationships. Data analytics goes a really long way. And I think our overall goal is to really democratize hiring and just make it possible for companies to actually hire people based off of who they are rather than their surface credentials and do that in like a deeply data-driven way. But I think that requires a pretty immersive, comprehensive system and buy-in from a huge number of companies. And so that expansion is already really underway, but I'd say by and large, it's this mix between sort of continuing to add to that suite while also continuing to perfect everything that we're already doing and then just continuing to kind of grow both our, our candidate base and, and our customers. I'm so excited to see the evolution, but I definitely think you need to get like a Ripple Match online store and have that on a t-shirt, like democratize <laughs> the hiring process. I, I love it, yeah. And, and we like owe it to our students, right? Like I, I think they've played like such a huge role in it. And increasingly the big ask we also get is, you know, this has just been terrific for us in the early career space. 
can you help us with that next job transition? Or as a yeah. student, right? I've used Ripple Match to find my internship and my full-time job. Now I'm two years in and getting ready for the right transition. And I think there's a delicate arc between being you know, a leader in a given category and starting to expand into new categories. But that's something we're always weighing and always thinking about. And I think ultimately Ripple Match will probably, hopefully if, if, if we have you know, the right amount of sort of skill and what play a role in transforming hiring as a whole, not just university hiring. Well, it needs it, to be honest. And I say that as a recruiter who's like working with like a cross section of companies, it definitely, sometimes I feel like I'm running into a wall um, <laughs> because trying to encourage companies to like, you know, change approaches. So um, that's why I was so happy that you agreed to come on um, the podcast because I think it's really important for people to see how successful you can be um, with a piece of tech that's for good, that's changing, not just like hiring, but like society, because as we said, giving people in these like underserved or underprivileged or whatever it would be, diverse communities access to opportunity, you're actually changing society, you know, it's a, Absolutely. you should be proud. I, I really appreciate that. And yeah, I sometimes think recruiters are sort of like the unsung heroes of a lot of these organizations. Like, I think occasionally, you know, they get in trouble for being pushy or whatever it might be. But most of the recruiters we work with are like genuinely trying to A, uh, provide a phenomenal candidate experience, B, improve diversity and inclusion, and C, have enormous head count goals that are sort of just lost <laughs> on them often from above without a lot of like advanced planning and it's their job to sort of navigate it and figure it yeah. out. And so we really see recruiters as kind of like our best partners in terms of 100%. being able to do this. And ideally technology can automate some of the more manual repetitive aspects of the job, but that frees recruiters up to really spend time on human connections, which is yeah, an area- Yeah, which is where they probably better. You can't replace, right? And so yeah. it's sort of optimizing how recruiters spend their time and really partner that and that kind of well, that is music great, great to my nice. ears music to my ears so I'm delighted to hear that we need all the help that we can get us poor recruiters but look Andrew thank you so so much for agreeing to come on the podcast we will share links I'm going to put up um the Lenovo and some some other uh links to what you guys are up to and I'll put uh the website up and let everybody have a look at it um, but yeah, thank you so much. And you are more than welcome to come back on at the end of the year or before then and tell us about how your official launch went with the CRM system. Yeah, this is terrific. I'd love to come back at some point and uh, congrats on all the success so far. And I'm uh, excited to keep listening and, uh, and hear some of your other interviews as well. Oh, thank you so much. Take care. Have a great day. Bye.